Amen. It's a good thing. The psalmist David said it was a good thing that we came into the house of the Lord. It was a good thing. So thank you for doing a good thing today. Amen. Exodus chapter 2. Hallelujah. I'm excited that also before we begin reading that we are coming up uh, on a celebration of eight years uh, in this ministry. Years before that, I was Pastor Jerry Brazil's assistant pastor. He trusted me before that with youth leadership. And you know, I, I thank God for all that He's done. And we're going to celebrate that in a couple of weeks with all that God has done through you all and this church. But I always want to give honor and to where honor is due. I thank God for raising up a man of God like Jerry Brazil. Yes. And that everything... Uh, Yes. That he has done for me and, and let God do through him. And he wouldn't have done it if God hadn't told him to do it. But Pastor Jerry, I thank you for opening up the pulpit. For seeing something in me that nobody else saw. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for letting God allow you uh, to be used in my life in a mighty way. Can we thank our... <laughs> And we just honor the 28 years before that eight years coming up that you and Sister Lily led this church, made the sacrifices in your own family, and sacrificed time, sacrificed uh, things that perhaps you longed to do, but you sacrificed it so you could do what God called you to do. How many know the calling of God takes a sacrifice? It takes a sacrifice. You have to be willing and you have to be available. Amen? You have to be available. And so we thank you both for that. God bless you. Alright, let's look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. Now where we are in this portion of scripture, we find a critical part of the nation of Israel's history where they've grown into one million people inside the nation of Egypt. Where Joseph had, he was one of the next to the youngest son of Jacob. Where Joseph had welcomed in his family during a famine some 400 years beforehand. Do you remember that? Do you remember when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers? But 10 years later, 10 years later after going through slavery, after having a lie told on him and put in prison, 10 years later he is elevated and promoted to the second most powerful man in all the world. He is the governor of Egypt because Egypt is, is the superpower nation at that time. And a famine begins to come and God gives him discernment and wisdom on how to prepare for the famine. They, 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 when they have seven years of plenty, they store up stuff in the warehouse so that when they go through seven years of famine and not enough, they're prepared. They're, they, they've been prepared. And so uh, that Pharaoh at that time had favor upon Joseph. And Joseph said, I want to bring my family in. He brought his brothers in. He forgave them for what they did to him. And he said, you know, God was raising me up for this. I see God's plan in it. Amen. So listen, we always need to forgive. But you also need to see what God's plan is in what it is you went through. Maybe you can say, hey, I think, you know, I forgive you for hating on me, but I actually thank you for hating on me because it has caused me to be the person that I am today. I am stronger because I'm stronger because you left me. I'm stronger because you hurt me. I'm stronger because you broke my heart. I'm stronger because you disappointed me and let me down. I forgive you for what you done, but I see what God was doing in it. Can I get a witness in the house this morning? And so... That happened, and so now the close bond between Joseph and the Pharaoh of old has been forgotten. 400 years have passed. It's been forgotten. With the present Pharaoh becoming so weary of the new enslaved, somewhere along the line, Sister Laura, one of the Pharaohs said, these people are getting to be innumerable. They're growing too much. I'm going to enslave them. They're not like us. We're going to, we're going to uh, put whips on their back. We're going to make them work. And we're going to feed them and provide them a place to live. And that's all they're going to have. But they're not going to have freedom. They're not going to have freedom. And so down the line that was decided. But now, even though they're enslaved, they are vast, vast amount of Israelites that a decree now has been issued to allow no more 
Israeli males or Hebrew male infant boys to live. Only the girls were allowed to live, I guess so that they could later on intermarry with Egyptians and this would reduce future threats of an uprising. They wouldn't have a, a male army to rise up. They would intermarry the girls uh, with the Egyptians. And But, you know, even though this was uh, decided, even though this has begun to be carried out, God had a plan on the way. Amen? And how many know that what the devil meant for evil, God can turn it around and make it good. Amen? I want you to look at your neighbor today and say, He can make it good. He can turn it around. Hallelujah. Let's look at verse 1 of Exodus chapter 2. It says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as a wife a daughter of Levi, so the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt. In some translations it says tar there. Tar and pitch. But the put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank, and his sister, their oldest daughter, stood afar off, to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out, of the water. I will not go over all of that scripture when we go back and do our review. I'm going to summarize this story and tell you a little bit more about it. Some of you perhaps are very familiar with this story. Perhaps it's the first time that some of you have ever even heard this scripture uh, be read aloud. Either way, wherever you're at, whatever you know, whatever level of learning you're at with the Bible right now, we're going to give you something that everybody can comprehend and can speak to everybody this morning. Whether you've ever read this story or not. Amen? But God has a term today that He wants to impart into us. And when we get to that part of the message today, I really want to drive it home. Amen? I'm not going to announce it yet, but I want you to be ready to receive what that term is. We're going to explain it. And I want you to be ready to implement it into your everyday lives. This is the only piece of Scripture we're going to stick with today. We could go into a lot of other different areas of the Bible, uh, Brother Jim, but we're going to stay right here today. Keep it simple. Keep it as brief as possible. Amen. But I can't always promise it a uh, 15 minute sermon. Amen. Sometimes we, I, I like to get into the deep things of God. I like to let the Holy Spirit expand what it is He wants to say. and Because He knows what you need. You may be sitting in your seat right now thinking God has forgotten all about you. And then all of a sudden, you hear a rainbow word for the season that you're in right now. How many are ready for a rainbow word? Meaning a right now word. message. Father God, we're thankful you've kept us through the night. You place a desire in our heart. Give us physical strength to do this morning. No God, you know what every heart needs to hear and receive yes. today. And we pray that you'll just speak to Brother Daniel this morning in such a way, oh God, that no one will leave empty, broken heart or lost Jesus. this morning. But oh God, that every need might be fulfilled here today. Yes. But we know that you're ready, willing, and able, God, to just reach down and touch your heart. In yes. Such a manner, God, that all with all the surety, as the most high living God has walked with among us today. Yes. We pray, God, you'll just give Brother Daniel the physical strength he needs. Let him not lack for any words, oh God. May his thoughts be your thoughts, oh God, as he speaks today. May it have an impact on every heart and every life. May all hell know and all heaven know today. That God's people are gathered together, yes. worship and glorify yes. you, God, 
and that good things are taking place, Father, right. because you're in the midst. Your power, your authority, your mercy, your love is present here today and is hovering over us. And we, God, we're just going to reach out and grab on to it. On. Now we know that you're going to give Brother Daniel freedom this morning. Right. May he preach like he never preached before. Oh. God, may he preach like this is the last yes. day you'll ever yeah. preach. And we listen like it's the last time we'll ever hear your word. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. God, we all step out on the bridge of faith today, yeah. ready to receive, oh God, your word. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Let's give God a shout of praise. Thank you so much, Pastor. Amen. Today's message, today's thought, today's subject matter is, is this. Drifting away from the old system. Or make it personal and say drifting away from your old system. Amen. Let's say your and let's say the whole thing together. Ready? Drifting away from your old system. Amen. The word system is defined as a set of connected things or parts that form a complex whole. A complex whole. Amen. And whole being W-H-O-L-E, meaning all of it. Amen. With synonyms meaning like words being wedded, program, routine. Life can certainly be and is complex with all kinds of people, places, and things, or we can sum it up and say nouns. Amen. We can have a little uh, literature class here today. Connected to us in life. In life, we have our routine programs and ways of doing certain things. So certainly we can see that we have our very own systems in our lives. And a form system, a formed system, can be a hard cycle to break away from. There's some systems that you don't need to change. It might be the, the best way to do it and you stick with it. But how many know that the longer you live, things will change? And you've got to learn how to come out of former systems. And you've got to learn to see the new things that God wants you to experience. Now, a a form system in your life can be a hard cycle to break away from. Even if the new or the next one you're heading for is better. Meaning you have seen other people go where you are being thrust into You have seen other people transition into that place. You've seen other people shift into the very place that you can see very clearly that God has taken you to. And you've seen them succeed there. But you're still reluctant to come out of your old system. Because old habits are hard to break. This is the way we've always done. I don't know anything else. Well, God wants you to know something new. Amen? And so what we need to figure out today is how do we transition when it's time to transition? How do we shift when it's time for a shift? And I don't want to be left behind in a system that is not for me anymore. If God wants me to go into a new system, I want to shift and transition. Amen? Because God is all about a transition. We talked about the rapture a while ago at the end of worship. What a shift that's going to be. What a transition that is going to be. Hallelujah. I need to be ready for that shift. I don't want to be left behind participating willingly in my old life, in my my old sin that I swore that I want to be a person who, and we've been talking about it all week, I want to love what he loves and I want to hate what he hates. Amen? I want to be ready for that shift. I want to be ready for that transition. Hallelujah. Praise God. The system, so to speak, that Moses was born into proved to be deadly. But he had parents willing to make an ultimate sacrifice. But even more so, a God who had an incredible plan for his life. Let's review the text and I'll summarize it as well. Now it's important to know that this decree has been made from this current and present Pharaoh that has said not only will they stay enslaved when they have babies, if the male, if it's a male, I want you to kill it. Let the girls live, but all the boys must die. And so right from the get-go, we see that when Jochebed, which that's Moses' mother's name, When Jochebed had Moses, she had something, she had someone that is beautiful, says it was a beautiful child. She was in love with him. 
No mother's not going to be in love with her baby. When I saw my youngest boy be born, I saw my wife go through absolute excruciating pain. And it took about, uh, I want to say, four big pushes. And I mean, it sounded, oh, so terrible to hear her scream like that. But as soon as my baby boy came out, she looked at him, we already had his name picked out, and she held him, and she cried, and she smiled, and she was relieved, and she said, Jackson, she won't feel no pain then. Hallelujah. She was in love, hallelujah, already. She was in love with him when he was formed in the womb. Can I get a witness? Because life, life, I don't care what they said on TV this week, I don't care what they announced to the nation, life begins in the womb. Amen. Hallelujah. Help me behave today, God. Help me behave today. How many Christians are getting fed up with the atrocities that are being pushed on our nation to say that even the day, even the day that a baby is due to be born, if they decide at the last minute they want to kill it, they want to kill it, sell it to Planned Parenthood, chop it up in slices. Come on, I'm going to be grabbing it because that's the horror. And they want to even it out. We don't want to talk about it in church. We don't want to talk about it because somebody in here might get offended because of who they may or may not be voting for or standing with. But I'm here to tell you right now, we are living in the last days when we will get on live television and say it's alright to take a fully formed nine month old baby. Yeah. 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 And we'll stand and clap. My God, we need to do as Pastor Franklin is saying. No, we need to pray. Yeah. We need to fast. Yeah. And then we need to go vote. Yeah. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Amen. I don't like this. There's two things I like to not talk about so much in the pulpit. It's politics and money. But there's a time. Amen. We need people to in the missions of faith because there's a great need in the community. Amen. So I hope that's all right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And I... Come on, politics is at the church's door, and the church has been silent so long. We've been silent so long, they couldn't even pray in school. But God is raising up an army to get prayer back in school. I hope you know that. I hope you know that children are praying in school again. And I don't want to offend anybody or make anybody feel like what your opinion is don't matter, but it comes down to this. Where do you stand on the basic biblical principles of the Word of God? Every life is important. The shed blood of the innocent, the God despises it. He hates it. And our nation will be judged. 3,500 children are being killed every day. And in the Old Testament, He would rise up Israel and say, Go wipe out the Moabites. Go wipe out the Amalekites. Don't leave a single one of them living. What were they doing? That God despised so much. They were shedding the blood of the innocent. They were sacrificing children on the altar and in the fire. Throwing children in the fire as part of that worship. My God, my God. Christians, it's, I didn't mean to go here. I'm trying to go somewhere else. But there is a righteous indignation in my heart. And I feel like Jesus felt the day when he walked into the temple and he started turning over the tables. And said, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. Hallelujah. And people are now saying, this has got to stop. Yes. Hallelujah. My God. Amen. And so she's holding her baby in her hand. Guess what she's holding? Not just a male baby. Brother Cooper, she's holding an extinct species. When a, when a species becomes extinct, what are some of those species that are becoming extinct right now? Is it the tiger? The tigers? Anybody else know the rhin rhinoceroses and things like that? So when you know, Billy Joe just went to Africa recently, when she sees a, an animal like you don't see over here, that's an amazing thing. But when you see a tiger, and you like when you go to the zoo and you see an animal like that, and you see it's just a magnificent wild animal, and there's not many of them, then that's an incredible thing to see something that is extinct. There's not many of them in the world. Can you imagine? Holding that child and her saying, There's not many of these right now. Because this Pharaoh is full of the devil that has told him to commit genocide 
against the people of God. Right. Kill all the boys. Who are you killing when you kill the boys? You're killing all the husbands. You're killing all the fathers. Amen? And that's happening here. That's the reason crime is up. Because so many fathers right. are not present. They're being taken out of the equation. Right. Amen? Amen? And so we're living in that time now. And we're also living in a time right now where a baby can live or he can die. But if you want to do it. She was living in that time now. And the Bible says when she had hid him, as long as she could hide him, when she had kept him quiet, as long as she could, I believe it was three months that she hid him, she took an ark. Somebody shout ark. ark. Oh, an ark is a good thing. An ark is a good thing. God raised up an ark and had Noah build it so that the pe his people could be saved and they could repopulate the earth. Spare. Amen. And then he had another ark called the ark of the covenant, where, where the covenant was kept and it represented the very presence of God. God wants to rise up an ark in our lives. Amen. And so he took Moses, an extinct baby, an extinct species. Man had said, this baby doesn't deserve to live just because of the sex that he is. He doesn't deserve to live. And so she put him in an ark. The ark protects the covenant. The ark protects the people. The ark, hallelujah, harnesses it and keeps the people rising up above destruction. When the floodwaters came, Noah and his family, while everybody else was being drowned in their sin, Noah and his family were rising up. And it's time for the people of God to rise up against all this mess that is plaguing our society. Am I preaching too hard on a Sunday? Hey! Hallelujah. She says, I can't hide him no more. I'm going to put him in an ark. I'm going to put him in an ark and I'm going to daub it with tar and pitch. I'm going to put protective coating around it. She did everything she could as a mother. The whole time saying, will I ever see him again? I won't get to see him grow up. I won't get him to see him take his first steps. I won't get to see him speak his first words. Will I ever see my child again? And then with a lot of hope, a lot of faith, this mother makes an ultimate sacrifice and she, she takes him and puts him in. I, I visualize Brother Brian. She puts him in the stream and she sends him on down and lets him drift away. Lets him drift. But she has, her, she actually sent her daughter to do it, her oldest daughter. She has, she has a, a destination for him, just a little ways off. She sees a, a, some, some reeds and some bushes. And she says, that'll catch him. And that'll keep him there. So that when Pharaoh's daughter comes out to bathe in this water, she'll see him. She'll see him. And maybe she'll take, uh, have compassion for him and take him in and raise him. I don't know if Pharaoh's daughter was barren and couldn't have a baby and it was common knowledge to people or what. But when Pharaoh's daughter sees that basket and she lays eyes on that baby, something tells me by the leading of the Spirit, when I read these scriptures, Sister Lisa, that she saw something that resonated with her and says, this is my chance to be a mother. Because being a mother is important. And she said, this is my chance. I'll raise him. I'll raise him. And she begins to maybe perhaps pick him up out of that basket and holds him and looks into his little eyes. And begins to see how beautiful he is. And then his sister, who's kind of hiding uh, a ways off, comes up and starts giving her some, some advice. And she says, she says, listen, um, you like that baby? You want to raise that baby? How about I get a nursemaid, meaning a, a Hebrew woman, that can nurse him and keep him healthy? And she says, okay. And she's so thankful for that piece of advice. It, it doesn't even kind of, when we read the story, it's almost like she would say, where did you come from? Where, where did you come from? Because all of a sudden, here's this person being so helpful, wanting to give her advice. And then what happens is she says, yes, take him, get him nursed up. And when he's weaned off of the breast milk, bring him back. Now, I, this all happened in the span of the same day. This mother who had put him in a basket in the ark of protection and didn't know when he left the house that day, Brother Terry, whether or not she'd ever see him again. Here, her daughter comes with the basket back and said, the king's daughter said, you can keep the baby a little longer 
so that you can feed and nourish the baby. Oh, and here's the thing, Mom. You're going to get paid to feed your own baby. You're going to get paid to feed your own baby. Hallelujah. God is going to... You need to look at somebody today and say, God is fixing to bless your life and expand you with what you already got, with what you're already doing. Hallelujah. And so she's getting paid to feed her own baby. Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses. Moses means to be drawn up out of the water. But guess what? He gets to go back and live with Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps a relationship was kindled there with Jochebed and Pharaoh's daughter. Perhaps Pharaoh's daughter never knew that Jochebed was the uh, biological mother of Moses. But here she was thinking she'd never see her baby again. And she got to see him in the same day and got to keep him longer and got to help him get stronger before he went off into his destiny. You see, he had to leave the system he was in because the system he was in was death. The system he was in was slavery. But now someone who was born to be a slave, actually somebody who was born to die is now going to live is now going to sit at the king's table. Amen. Now, I don't know how Pharaoh's daughter got it by her father that she had this child. I don't know how she covered that up. But the Bible says he was raised up in the palace. He was raised up in the palace as an Egyptian. He had to come out of his old system so he, that, that represented death so that he could go into the system that represented life. So baby Moses is sent drifting down the river away from slavery and death to the palace of opportunity and favor. Hallelujah. How many want to come out of where you've been and come into a place of opportunity and favor? Amen. Go to the planet with your shot today. You see, when he was born, he was born and he broke through. He broke through when he was born. He was born to break through. And guess what? Later on, he would grow up to bring his people through. He was a living, breathing example of a breakthrough. And God raised him up to go to Pharaoh and said, God said, let my people go. It didn't matter that he was shy. It didn't matter that he was scared to death to speak in public. God still called him. A lot of you will disqualify yourself by character flaws, by sins you've committed, by things you've done, and by things that people have called you in life. Amen? But God said, or, so, or maybe a, 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 an inability you have, or a disability you have. But God says, uh-uh, you're not getting out of this. I called you. I called you. And until you get a little bit more comfortable, you want your brother Aaron to speak, fine. Amen. But have you ever noticed that as the, as the text goes on in the book of Exodus, Moses gets bolder and bolder and bolder to the point that Aaron is not speaking for him anymore. Moses is speaking. Moses is speaking. Hallelujah. He got so upset that he committed murder when he saw his own people being mistreated by the Egyptians. So even though he had been a man of sin, God raised him up anyway to deliver a nation. How many know that God can use anybody he wants to, hallelujah, as his hands will be, to rise up and say, we're coming up out of this as a nation in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Give him some glory right now. Give him some glory. Now, when he went to go bring the people out, Guess what they said? They were reluctant. They were reluctant. They began to say, after he finally got, well actually God did, by sending the plagues upon Egypt. And finally, when Egypt had been plagued so much, Pharaoh finally said, just leave. Just get out. They couldn't take it anymore. And Moses began to lead a million people out of Egypt into the wilderness. They crossed the Red Sea in which it parted and they walked through it on dry land. And when Pharaoh changed his mind, brought his army of chariots to chase them, the water collapsed on them and drowned them. Right? But when they got to the other side and they got in the wilderness and they got away from all the things that they'd been used to. They'd been used to slavery. They'd been used to being uh, having to work all day, long hours. The men had been used to having their 
backs whipped by taskmasters. And they had no, they broke their will. They took their decisions away. If they wanted to take their wives from them and abuse them, they did. They, had, they could not say anything because they were in a bondage system. They were in a, a slavery system. That's what a system, that's why slavery is so wrong. It takes away the human rights of a human being. And say, and as a man telling another man, I will do whatever I want to to you. Come on, somebody. And there is modern day slavery. There are slaves. Certainly, uh, there is human trafficking going on in our in our world today, where people are enslaved. And, but there's no worse uh, slavery than the bondage of sin that enslaves people who walk around full of pride, thinking they got everything under control, when they're nothing but a puppet of the devil. They're a tool of the enemy. They don't have control over their own life. For 28 years. Brother John, I thought I had some control. I thought that I was doing some things. But I look back now, I didn't have control of my own life. The enemy was running me to and fro and all over the place. And for anybody lost and undone in this room right now, he's doing the same thing to you that he did to me. But one day I took a stand and said, enough, enough. I'm coming out of this thing. I'm coming out of my old system and I'm going into this new system in the name of Jesus. Amen. Somebody ought to give him a shout of praise for salvation. They were reluctant to come out of the old system. They even began to say in their murmuring and complaining, Well, at least back in Egypt, we had food in our bellies and we had a roof over our head. When God's Shekinah glory cloud was providing a supernatural roof over their head, He was raining down now from heaven. Can you imagine that? Manna. Sweet cakes. You ever go to the carnival fair and you can smell the, what is it called? The uh, funnel cake. Yeah. I would liken manna unto a funnel cake. <laughs> Calorie free, fat free yeah, yeah, yeah. funnel cakes. Yeah. Rain it down from heaven. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. How good they smell. You can smell them. Ah. Oh. <laughs> and they were complaining about funnel cake. <laughs> well, they had rather eat the slop that Pharaoh fed them back in slavery simply because they were reluctant to come out of their old system and go into the new system. Because you know what? God didn't rain enough manna down every day for them to store up and be able to prepare for tomorrow. Because God didn't want them to forget about Him. So each day He gave them what they needed for that day. So they wouldn't go a day without saying, God, I need you. God, I'm thankful. God, I still need you every day. We are a spoiled society because it takes a lot sometimes to get us on our knees, on our face, and thank God for what He's already done. My God, they were reluctant to come out of the old system and into the new. But see, the picture of baby Moses right from the beginning was him coming out of a system that represented slavery and death and coming in the new. Moses had broken through all his life and now he wanted them to break through with him. Hallelujah. We need, like I said while I go to during worship, we need to be bumping elbows and brushing shoulders with other overcomers. Because you might forget what it's like to overcome. But you need to remember that God is no respecter of a person. What He did for someone else, He shall do for you. Amen. Now here's the term that I was speaking of in the beginning of the message. Here it is. We must move forward from what we've known to what we can know. Amen? We need forward thinking. Somebody shout, forward thinking. Forward thinking. I want you to really shout it because it's important. Forward, forward thinking. thinking. Mm -hmm. We need forward thinking. We need, that's, what, that's how faith works. I, want some, I, I don't want just faith, I want some prophetic faith. 
Some faith that moves me ahead of, of where I am going. Amen? Prophecy was given in the Bible, and yes, it edifies, it builds up. But a lot of the prophecy in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament. And any prophecy about Jesus Christ's second coming has yet to be fulfilled. Yet because he has to come back. Amen? He's not come back in the rapture. And we know the rapture is just the rapture. It will be just the rapture. His second coming comes after the seven year tribulation. Amen? But forward thinking is what we need. We don't need backwards thinking. We don't need thinking that's just for today. Hallelujah? We need forward talking. We need new ideas. We need creativity. Listen, I want to talk to everybody that's doing anything in this church. Think forward. Talk forward. Be innovative. And be creative. Be creative. God has given you an easel. He has given you a, 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 a spiritual paintbrush in your hand. Hallelujah. He has commended you to paint a masterpiece with whatever He has called you to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't just be mundane. Don't say, well, we'll just throw something together. No, 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 no. Hallelujah. This church don't throw things together. The leaders we have in this church have been called by the Most High God to provide a standard of excellence. Amen. And a standard of excellence draws people because we serve a God who is excellent. We serve a God who was perfect. We serve a God who was created that was able to take and form human life with His hands. And we're made in His image. So anything God puts in your hands, get ready to mold it into a master. Hallelujah. We need to be creative. Listen, but people refuse to think forward. People refuse to come out of their own system. That's the whole reason Jesus was not accepted by the church. Due to the fact that they had a lack of forward thinking. Here he is. The one they prayed about. The one that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied about. Here he is. Saying I am. Here he is saying before Abraham was. I am. And they said that's blasphemy. Uh -huh. You're not coming in here. You're not coming in here and changing. We're making good salaries. Oh, the people are paying the offering, and we ain't, we ain't helping no city. We ain't helping no poor folks. We're just getting rich. We're buying. Oh, we're, they, they had roads back then, and they just walked around and looked at the people like they were peasants. They had no willingness to even uh, pray for nobody. They were getting richer and richer and richer, and they were more like uh, political figures than they were leaders in the church. So when God came in the flesh in front of them, they couldn't see because they wanted to stay in the system. That they had been living high off the hog. Right. Right. Can I get a witness? That's why it's time to tear some things down in this country that have been raised up and then the people get fat and high off the hog. Yeah, I said it, amen. It's time, hallelujah, for some strongholds to be torn down. Hallelujah. And say that this thing's over with. This thing is over with. True religion is when you help the widow and the orphan. That's true religion. Hallelujah. But they couldn't even see it. God was standing right in front of them. But they didn't want to come out of their own system. They liked where they were. They liked where they were. They were. What's the polar opposite of that? Being in a place that's full of lack. Full of impoverished mentality. Always, you know, we've always been poor. We've always not had enough. Let me tell you something. I know some people. They probably can't even be considered middle class. But they've got the Lord, and they're not lacking for anything. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's, a, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. But there's also people who struggle, and they struggle because they're reluctant to talk differently. They're reluctant to think differently. They're reluctant to walk, in, walk right smack dab into breakthroughs that God has busted the door open again and again. But they don't want to come out of their own system. Because they're used to being in that old system. This is where we've always been. And guess what happens when we refuse to come into old systems? Families don't get better. Divorce will happen. Somebody's got to decide, we've got to change some things in this house. Partnerships and businesses don't thrive and grow. One's holding the other one back and they fail. Ministries don't grow because we want to do things the way that we've always done. And so we want to stay right here. And we don't want it to get too loud. We, and they, they're so, come on. I, there's a mentality in some churches that say, we don't want to grow too much. We like it small. We like it that way. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. 
And then they got a pastor behind the pulpit begging God for growth. And he's preaching to a lukewarm dead congregation every Sunday morning. He no, we want it just like it is. Oh, it's getting quiet in here, but I thrive in that. I thrive in that. Listen, I'll accept whatever God wants to do with this church. Amen? I'll be right here as long as He'll have me here. Amen? And God, if you want to grow it, grow it. You want to bust it out, bust it out. You want to build another building, build another building. Whatever you want to do, I'm ready. If you want to take us from this system and put us in another one, whatever you say, do, God. Where you lead, we will follow. Can I get a witness? And that don't mean making a mockery of the house of God. That don't mean doing things that don't have nothing to do with the Bible and the things of Jesus Christ. Come on. That don't mean that we can't have some lights and we can't have some, some good praise and worship music. Hallelujah. I love it. That don't mean that we can't wear blue jeans on a Sunday morning. I am not less anointed because I got blue jeans on. Yes. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Praise God. But we've got, we will still have a, a maintain modesty. Amen. The people of God, the leaders of God. Hallelujah. We're going to still maintain some modesty. But my gosh, I want to go wherever God wants to take me. Hallelujah. And if I'm the problem, I'll get out of the way and say, God, change me. Change my heart. Change my perspective. Help me to stretch. Help me to walk into this new system. We need forward thinking, forward talking, new ideas. But there's also, you know, we talk about the, the people in the, in the church that couldn't see Jesus and they were living high off the hog and they didn't want to come into that system that they had gotten used to, that they had embellished off of. There's also the not enough impoverished mentality that can be a mainstay in life unless we forward think and talk our way out of it. I can have more. God said, Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He didn't say, I have come that you may have life and have less. I have come that you may have life and struggle. No, He said, you'll have your trials and tribulations in this world. But behold, I've overcome this world. I've overcome this world. Every day won't always be perfect, but you are serving one who is. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we got to talk our way out of it. Hallelujah. That is why we must connect with overcomers. We must connect with innovators. We must connect with go-getters. We must connect with people who make things happen. Maybe you're not in a place where you know how to make things happen. I don't know how to put the pieces of this puzzle together. God will give you boldness to go ask for some help. We can't do it all on our own. That's why delegation is so important. My gosh, if I didn't delegate in this church, who would they be with me out here right now on a, on a stretcher? I can't do all this stuff on my own. I need these leaders. I need these vision leaders. I need these, the, the finance team. I, I, I need help. You need help. Hallelujah. We need to delegate. And if there's something that you're thinking about, something that you're longing for, bump shoulders and elbows with somebody who's made it happen. I've got a dream, Pastor. I want to start my own business. Do you know how many entrepreneurs are sitting in this room right now that you can talk to and learn from? Do you know we have a, a finance class in this church to help you sow, to help you receive the most out of what you get and to live a biblical life that will grow your finances? Do you know that we have a discipleship program that shows people this is what happened to you. You're saved now. This is how you go at the Bible. This is how you receive from the Bible. Basic things that I can't always hit on in here. And we've got that here in this church right here in little old Sandy Cross, North Carolina. That I believe God is pleased with. We've got a, a worldwide missions department. We have somebody that jumped there back today and already over there serving. Billy Joe Hopkins just got back from Africa. Be in the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. There are some incredible things going on right here. Get involved. Ask about it. You can't do everything. But we can do something. And if you don't know how to make your dream come true, God will put you with people who are walking in their dreams. They are successful at the very dreams they're dreaming of. Amen. In closing, I want to tell you this. I'll tell you a few things. Does anybody get anything out of this today? Are we ready to drink the drink? Huh? Y'all remember the song Drift Away? Change the words to it. 
Come on, Jesus, save my soul. I want to get lost in your Holy Ghost and drift away. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. But this is why fellowship is so vital. We need to come together and the enemy attacks it. He takes people out of the house of God. He takes people out of fellowship opportunities. We may look at it as just coming to another meeting. We may look at it as just going to another service. You don't know what God is going to put in your path. When you fellowship with other believers, other innovators, other overcomers, other go-getters, other people who make things happen. You need to meet dreamers who have succeeded at their dream. You need to meet them. And if you're here today, and when it comes to this message, coming out of the old system and going into the new, perhaps you're here today, and you've come to the altar before. And you've said what you would say as a sinner's prayer. Maybe you did or didn't get baptized. You know, we have that a lot. But we can even get a baptism schedule. People don't, don't run back into the world. Come on, somebody, let's address it. It's happening. Do you know what it is? What is it? Jesus addressed it in the Bible. He told the parable of the soils. He said the seed falls down and the fowls of the air come and gobble it up before it can even take root. So when you see somebody in the altar crying out saying, Save me, Jesus. And two or three weeks later, they're not even here anymore. The foul of the air gobbled up the seed. It happens. It happens. But there are also people who will keep on plugging away. They will keep on trying despite the things they're still in. Despite the mindset of the old system they're still in. Despite the sin that they're still committing. And guess what it is? They don't believe enough in themselves that they can live this thing. Because of who they've always been called and what they've always been attached to. But if they'll get this right here, that it's not about them, it's about Him, and that He is greater than the sin, He is greater than the old life, He is greater than the old mentality, and if you'll just really let Him in and get your eyes on what He has done for your life, get your eyes on the fact that He saved you from the burning pits of hell, hallelujah, and that He is coming again, and you will fall head over heels in love with the one that wants to fill you with His resurrection power. You will fall head over heels in love with the one that wants to rapture you up and get caught up with Him and all the other believers in the air one day. If you'll get your eyes on Him, you will overcome. You will come out of the old system and be able to walk into the new system. Can I get a witness? You can live this new life. You can. You just got to simply drift away. You got to drift away. You got to drift away into the new system. See, a lot of people will come to the new system and they'll drift back into the old. The Bible even uses that term, drifting away. They call it, it's to reflect falling away, backslide. Away from your covenant. Away from your salvation. But you need to drift from your old mindset. You need to drift away from your traditions. Drift away from your religion. That you that was embedded in you when you were young. Perhaps they told you, oh, it don't matter. You said this little prayer when you were five years old. You can go out. And then you went out and, and you, maybe you live like the world. You, I'll say right now, you live like hell on earth. Never adhere it. To a God who forgives and says, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. And perhaps you were in a religious system that says you got to do this and you got to do that. Oh, and if you do this, oh, you ain't going to make it. You ain't going to make it. There's so many religious systems out there tearing down the people of God. They don't never think they're good enough. Come on, right. yeah. But that's where you need to be. Talk and pounding on about the gospel of grace. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to trip and you're going to fall. But if you got your eyes on Him, you don't let nobody tell you you're going to go to hell every other day. Come on. He fills in our gaps with His abundant, massive grace. Hallelujah. Well, I feel, about, I feel bad about this. I feel bad about that. Well, quit beating yourself up. But thank God that you can still get convicted. And that you don't have a reprobate mind. The truly backslidden, the true ones who have fallen away from the covenant, don't even want to be in the house of God, much less pop open a Bible and pray. They don't care what they're doing. They're willingly participating in the old life again. And it's up to 
to them whether or not they ever surrender to a sign, to a call, to a conviction, if it's possible. There are people who have gone too far. But you're not one of them because you're here right now. Amen. And if you'll let God, He will do something amazing in your life today if you've got time for it. Can we stand to our feet? Does anybody got time for the Holy Spirit to pull on somebody's heart? And for every Christian in here, I want to ask every saved person, how many saved people we got in here? Have you got time for somebody else to get saved? Yes. It ain't all about you, right? It ain't all about you. Because how many saved people in here know that you were saved from the fires of hell? That you were saved from a life that wasn't enough? And listen, here's the thing. You had to make that decision. There, I got saved. My wife couldn't make that decision for me. My mama couldn't make that decision for me. Pastor Jerry couldn't make that decision for me. I had to do it. I had to do it. I had to do it on my own. If I was, and we've got folks in here that I believe right now are all at the age of accountability. We've got our middle schoolers who are seeing and hearing so much stuff. I pray for my son every day as he goes into the public school. Lord, protect him from what he hears. Let him rebuke and push out the things that are sowed in him. And let him only keep what he needs. But God, let his light shine even so much brighter than the darkness and illuminate the darkness around him. So when they're telling the nasty jokes and they're looking at the filthy things on their phones, he doesn't adhere to it, laugh at it, and just it. Amen? I have that prayer every morning in the school line. I keep my eyes open. I ain't praying with my eyes closed when I'm driving. But God hears me. He hears me. And I'm proud of my son. I'm proud of the young man. He's becoming. So we've got middle schoolers and high schoolers in here, along with the adults. And I want every head to bow, every eye to close. This is a crucial moment, so I would ask you from the bottom of my heart. From this point right on, no more moving around. 